Hello, good morning, <coughs> good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm just typing in the numbers here so you can dial in live on the show and get your questions answered. But if you have any questions in the meantime, you can already type them into the chat pad or you can just wait until I share the numbers here and then you can dial in live on the show if you like. But feel free to type your questions into the chat pad. I'll start uh, with the content in a minute. Give me one minute, please. Okay. All right. Hello again. Thank you so much for coming on <clears throat> to the show. Another your questions answered live session for intensive care at home and intensive care hotline. I'll uh, have so many questions prepared, but feel free to um, either dial in live on the show and ask your question live on the show over the phone or type them into your chat pad and I will get to them um, right here and then. So before we go into today's uh, questions, um, so obviously I do these uh, calls every every week, once a week, usually on a Sunday morning, my time, 10.30 a.m. here, Sydney, Melbourne time, uh, 6.30 p.m. on a Saturday evening, Eastern Standard Time in North America, uh, 3.30 p.m. Pacific time in um, in North America. It's 11.30 p.m. in the UK on a Saturday night. So before I go into today's questions, just a little bit about me, uh, what makes me qualified to answer questions here, here live on the show for families in intensive care and intensive care at home. I'm a critical care nurse by background. I have worked in intensive care for over 20 years in three different countries. Out of those 20 years or so, I have worked for over five years as a nurse unit manager in intensive care. For the last 10 years, I have been consulting, advocating for families in intensive care all around the world as part of my intensivecarehotline.com consulting and advocacy service. And I'm also the founder of Intensive Care at Home, where we send intensive care nurses into the home for long-term intensive care patients, predominantly with ventilation and tracheostomy. Sometimes they are non-invasively ventilated with BiPAP or CPAP. Sometimes they're not ventilated at all, but have a tracheostomy. And sometimes we have clients at home that are medically complex and need an intensive care nurse that are not necessarily ventilated or have a tracheostomy. Uh, at the end of the day, we are providing a genuine alternative for long-term intensive care patients at home uh, instead of a, a long-term stay in intensive care. Uh, we also provide services at home, such as home TPN, which is intravenous nutrition. So again, a bit of housekeeping, dial in live on the show if you like. Uh, you don't need to share your name. You can just stay anonymous if you prefer that. Uh, but I still answer your question. And if you have any other questions, just type them into the chat pad. And um, we will go from there. Just in terms of intensive care at home, we are currently operating in all major capital cities in Australia. We are an NDIS uh, accredited um, provider, but we are also accredited through ISO 9001 2015. So we are a third party accredited service one way or another. And I argue we are looking after the sickest clients in the community in Australia with intensive care at home because we're employing hundreds of years of intensive care nursing experience. We work with highly qualified doctors that can help us um, make our services safe and look after clients at home safely. So, and if you are in Australia and you want intensive care at home, please contact us at intensivecareathome.com on one of the numbers on the top of our website. Also, like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel and let's get started with the first question from Steve. Hi, Steve. 
Steve says, several times I have heard you say you want to avoid a tracheostomy at all costs, yet most of the time you seem to feel it's the proper procedure. What's the difference? Great question, Steve. So a lot of times when families come to us, they're coming to us too late. So what do I mean by that? And that's when I probably say it's the right procedure. So let's just say your loved one is going into intensive care today, tomorrow, in the next three days. Your research needs to start then. So if your research starts then, then you should ideally come to one of my articles where, uh, articles and video where I say how to um, avoid a tracheostomy. That's one article, but there would be other articles as well, such as how to wean someone off the ventilator with a breathing tube or an endotracheal tube. But that is something that needs to happen day one. So I tell you nine times out of 10, if I say, tracheostomy is the right procedure. These patient, uh, families come to us two weeks down the track and they haven't really looked at what should have happened between day one and day 14. That's where they're falling short, right? One of my um, instructions or advice to families is from day one, you need to make sure the intensive care team is doing everything beyond the shadow of a doubt to avoid the tracheostomy, and it's often not happening. Patients are getting put in an induced coma. They're not being woken up properly. They're not going through spontaneous breathing trials. Um, they're almost geared up for a tracheostomy from day one, right? And even more so in the US, and I'll tell you why, Steve, I'm not sure where you are, whether, where, whether you're in North America or somewhere else, because in the US, You've got those LTACs on the other end. And ICUs, I believe, have become complacent. They know if they can't get someone off a ventilator and they need a tracheostomy, they're not trying hard enough because they know there's an LTAC on the other end that they can send patients to. Now, in other countries, let's just say the UK or here in Australia, there is no LTAC. So ICUs are under, under much more pressure to avoid a tracheostomy to get patients out earlier and recover them, right? So that's what I've observed by really talking to people in the US almost every day. Does that make sense, Steve? Do you have an example to um, do you have an example to give me? Or, you know, is it, is it a situation that you are dealing with? You know, can you give me more context while you why you're asking the question? But in the meantime, while I'm waiting for you, Steve, I'm just about to read out the first question from this week. Um, and I've got an email here from a reader who says, my mother was in ICU for two weeks and then moved to select specialty for the last six weeks. That's within the hospital. She was intubated and extubated three times while in the ICU. Then she had a tracheostomy before heading over to select care. They're having difficulties weaning her off the ventilator. What should I do? Okay, let me read that again. My mother was in the ICU for two weeks, then moved to select specialty for the last six weeks. That's within the hospital. She was intubated and extubated three times while in the ICU. Then she had tracheostomy before heading over to select care. They're having difficulty weaning her off the ventilator. Okay, so it's uh, it's really interesting that you say that in your email. The the challenge here is probably that she's not getting mobilized. And why am I saying that? You know, I don't know what you mean with select specialty. It could mean that there's an LTAC within the hospital. You haven't specified that. But it could be that there's an LTAC within the hospital. And if there's an LTAC within the hospital, then um, chances are there are not the right staffing or skill levels within that place. Tom, nice to see you. Select specialty is an LTAC in the US. I thought it was. I thought it was. And nice to see you, Tom, and nice to have you participate here. Um, I thought it was. And um, I know that I've come across select specialty in various areas in the US uh, with some clients. The, the reader that sent this email didn't specify their location. Um, but I think select specialty has LTACs all around the US. Tom, maybe you can... You can comment on that if um, if you know more about it. But I'm pretty sure I've come across select specialty 
on the East Coast as well as on the West Coast in the US with some LTACs. But anyway, let's assume it is an LTAC. Then from my experience, uh, when consulting and advocating for clients all over the US is that the staffing and skill levels are pretty average. I would even say poor. Therefore, your mom is probably not getting mobilized. There's probably no plan to, um, no proper plan to wean her off the ventilator. I'll tell you another thing that's happening in LTAX, and it just happened this week where I had someone contact me saying, my mom went into LTAC. Yeah, actually one of our members said, my mom went into LTAC now and day 10, she has not made any progress. And now they're counting down the day saying, if she hasn't been weaned off the ventilator by day 30, she needs to go to a skilled nursing facility. Now, similar to Steve's question from the beginning, um, when someone goes into LTAC from day one, the time is ticking, the clock is ticking and someone needs to get started on weaning off the ventilator from day one because they often only give patients 30 days and that's that may or may not be enough and what we are seeing in LTAX is simply the skill and staffing levels are so poor that it often isn't happening uh, within that 30-day window and if it's not properly addressed from day one weaning trials mobilization physical therapy Patients will not come off the ventilator, especially if they had a prolonged induced coma in intensive care with deconditioning, muscle wastage and so forth. So I think that is what's happening here from our reader with that email because they're having difficulty weaning her off the ventilator. Most LTACs have difficulties weaning patients off the ventilator. So Steve, thank you so much for getting back to me. You're saying I'm in the US and have no specific example at this point, but your videos are also interesting and well done. I watch all of them and wanted to resolve the discrepancy. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sure, you're welcome. And um, please feel free to ask any other questions if, you, if you'd like. So, you know, the biggest challenge here really, Steve, is that families don't do their research from day one and, and they don't know the timelines either. You know, when you when someone enters intensive care, you wouldn't know what to look for, would you? You know, unless you've worked there, unless you've seen the patterns. Um, you know, it's difficult. OK, let's go to the next question. And. Uh, so here's another reader that writes in and who says my mom is 53 and overweight. She had an absent tooth and ended up with sepsis. She then had a Ludwig procedure and has been on a ventilator for almost two weeks. What should we do? The doctors want to keep her under sedation for longer. Okay, that is a very interesting question. A Ludwig procedure is actually a, a procedure for a tracheostomy. Now, it's not clear to me why they would keep your mum under sedation. Now. When someone is having sepsis, right, um, well, the sepsis needs to be addressed often with and IV antibiotics, you know, often patients can be hemodynamically very unstable. They can need uh, multiple inotropes, vasopressors. They can be very unstable. Um, and if that is the case, then patients are in a prolonged induced coma often. Now you have not shared whether they've uh, cured the sepsis or not. You know, you should be advocating for waking up your mum as quickly as possible because of the negative side effects of an induced coma, which are again, um, potentially delirium, ICU psychosis, uh, deconditioning, muscle wastage. The longer someone is in an induced coma, the more side effects there are and the longer it takes for them to wake up and almost start basic human functions such as walking, talking, sitting up, eating, drinking from scratch, you know. So from that perspective, your next question should be uh, whether the sepsis is taken care of, whether your mom is hemodynamically stable, whether she's still on inotropes or vasopressors, potentially for low blood pressure. Often sepsis is also treated with steroids. And if, you know, she is stable, wake her up there, should nothing stop Nothing should be stopping her from waking up. 
Okay, so then uh, the other thing you um, should be looking for is blood results. For example, what is her white cell count? What is her white cell count? Um, does she have a temperature still? You know, if she has sepsis, do they need potentially to use a PA catheter or a Swan-Gans catheter because she um, is hemodynamically un unstable? Um, you know, she's peripherally dilated. Maybe her lactate is, is climbing. Maybe her lactate is high. White cell count is still high. You know, if, if that's all resolved, then your mom should be getting out of the induced coma. Now, you also mentioned that an absent tooth led to sepsis. Again, is uh, a dentist involved? You know, what needs to happen with the tooth to make sure the sepsis is not getting any worse? Okay, let's... Uh, Let's get on to the next question. Uh, oh yeah, this is actually a good one as well. And, you know, might be repetitive for some of you watching this, especially if you're watching my videos regularly, but I actually did make a quick tip video about this this week, but I think it is important to uh, make it a topic here uh, briefly on the show again, where we had an email from a reader who says, the ICU is pushing a DNR the end of life narrative and they have no respect for our wishes. So I've made a quick tip video about it this week. And, you know, I mean, this is something obviously that frustrated me immensely when I worked in ICU that, you know, this DNR and end of life narrative was always pushed and that families had not been asked for their opinion and what they wanted. It was always framed in a way of, well, if we continue treatment here, then um, your loved one won't have any quality of life. And it's not in their quote unquote best interest to live and have no perceived quality of life. You know, and I think it is important that we are talking about perception here um, because it is a perception. You know, we've got Tom or Tom was here a minute ago. I'm not sure whether Tom is still here, but Tom has his son at home on a ventilator and, you know, him and his family and some nurses are looking after his son 24 hours a day at home. And he's on a ventilator with a trach, with a tracheostomy, you know. And I'm sure that Tom, for example, would have heard it all the way along that, you know, his son won't have any quality of life if he ends up with a trach, you know. And I'm sure he's heard the narrative all before, but Tom nevertheless opted to have his son at home. Um, with similar services like intensive care at home. Tom is in the US, you know, but if you ask our clients for intensive care at home, you know, they have all been pushed the DNR and end of life narrative, and they have all felt disrespected, you know, to the point where with some of our clients, for example, they had their loved ones in ICU, um, for example, C1 spinal injury or motor neuron disease or whatever it might be, and they've been told, well, you know, if we do a tracheostomy here, your family member won't have any quality, any quality of life. Wouldn't you want to donate some organs instead? You know, and that's a real, um, a real challenge for families. And they feel very much disrespected by having asked those questions. Whereas for those families, it's quite clear they want a tracheostomy regardless. And now those clients are at home with our service intensive care at home and they're very happy to be alive, you know. So it is very much about what families, patients and families wants, not so much what hospital wants, you know. Um, and also, for example, a few weeks ago, we had a client uh, who had their father in intensive care with a terminal disease. And, um, you know, I would have argued that any treatment that was done was prolonging the life, you know. Uh, rightly or wrongly, but for this particular family, it was very important to have everything done because it was part of their culture, part of their religion, part of what their father wanted, you know, wanting to go out on a fight. Now, I'm not here to judge this. I'm just here to say that it's not a one-size-fits-all. ICUs always want to make it a one-size-fits-all, saying, well, this particular patient with this disease and this illness won't have any quality of life if um, if we continue treating here and if we get to a point where they can leave ICU, for example, with a, with a service like intensive care at home. 
you know. So it's, it's, it is important that from day one, you as a family create your own narrative and we can help you creating your own narrative, you know. So don't want to spend too much time on, on this topic today because I've already made a, a quick tip video about this this week and you will find it in, in our YouTube channel or on our website on the blog section. Um, so yeah, let's uh, move along to the next question. Now, if you enjoy watching the video and if you get value out of it, give it a like, subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notification bell so you get notified when new videos or new YouTube live sec uh, shows are coming up. Um, also, we had a question uh, from a local hospital here in Melbourne in the last couple of weeks. So uh, one hospital approached us and said, and this is, you know, they already have the answer, but this is for other hospitals as well. Um, and they asked us, uh, or they told us that they have a number of tracheostomy uh, clients sitting on their respiratory ward and they can't move them on because uh, they can't find services in the community that can take these tracheostomy patients. And they asked, obviously, if we intensive care at home can look after tracheostomy patients at home. And the answer is absolutely yes. You know, that is our area of expertise. Anything at home, tracheostomy, ventilation, ventilation and tracheostomy, non-invasive ventilation, home TPN. Um, so that's all our area of expertise. And, you know, they told us that they can't find any specialist services that can help them alleviate and manage their bed block. So um, for any hospital, this is our area of expertise. All of our intensive care nurses can do that at home and um, help uh, patients at home, you know, to alleviate your exit blocks, your bed blocks, whether they are in ICU or on the respiratory ward. So please contact us at intensivecareathome.com and we can take the next steps with you to get your clients out of, or patients out of uh, your hospital and send them home and improve their quality of life. Tom, thanks for your comment and thanks again for joining. Good summary of our situation. We've managed the bend at home for now 15 months and our son's quality of life is very good compared to the DNR alternative proposed in the hospital setting. Yeah, and I'm sure, Tom, um, you know, you would have to a degree needed a lot of courage to go down that track because I guess it, it was a step into the unknown. And I guess a lot of families also shy away from that. You know, it takes probably takes a lot of courage in going down that track and saying, yes, we are going to do this come hail, rain or shine, you know, and um it's great that you can be such a role model, hopefully for other families too, you know, that it can be done. And I know when we spoke, I think you've sacrificed, you and your family probably are sacrificing a lot to uh, enable your son to live at home. And again, I, I, I know it takes a lot of courage to take a stand and say, we don't have the DNR, thank you very much. We want to make this happen no matter what. So... Thanks again for sharing this, uh, Tom. I admire you and your family to make that happen for your son. It's great. It's great. You're a great, great role model. Fantastic. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next question that we had this week. Yes, it's definitely not for the faint-hearted. It's not for the faint-hearted at all. You know, and it's even with, even if you had our service, you know, it's not for the faint hearted for us either. You know, as much as I keep saying of what we are doing on a day by day basis, even for us, it's not for the faint hearted. You know, we constantly need to keep our finger on the pulse seven days a week, what's happening with our clients, you know, uh, in order to make it safe and keep it safe. You know, uh, it's a 24 hour, seven day a week operation. And yeah, it's definitely not for the faint hearted, you know, but it's worth all the way along um, for every client that we're looking after, for every family that we are trying to help, you know, it's, it can be done. It can be done. Okay, so next question um, from this week. When do you accept no longer weaning off tracheostomy and ventilation for a loved one who's mentally alert and physically disabled? 
when do you accept no longer weaning off the tracheostomy and ventilation for a loved one who is mentally alert and physically disabled? So that is actually a very good question. So you, unfortunately, you haven't shared, you know, um, what exactly you mean with being physically disabled. Um, I guess what you might be referring to is that ventilation weaning is no longer possible. Let's just assume that is what you are saying, because I'm not quite clear what you're saying. My interpretation of your question is that ventilation weaning and tracheostomy weaning is no longer possible. Your loved one is mentally alert, but is physically disabled. Okay, this is a great question and is something we are dealing with every day. So it comes back to what I mentioned a minute ago. Um, you know, some of our clients, for example, they might have motor neuron disease, they might have cerebral palsy, they might have a C1, C2 spinal injury, and they're all mentally alert, and they are physically disabled, and they are unable to wean off the ventilator. So now the question comes back to, again, to what is your subjective opinion of quality of life for your loved one? You know, can he or she have quality of life on a ventilator on an ongoing basis? You know, it's a question that you need to ask yourself with your loved one, with your family. Is this something your physically disabled family member would want? And then looking at the option, you know, the question is, can you accept it? Can your loved one accept it? What are the resources you need to keep going? And in what setting can you keep going? You know, is again, home care like with intensive care at home an option? You know, you haven't shared your area. You know, where are you? If you're in Australia, you should contact us at intensivecareathome.com because we can help you take your loved one home, even if they can't be weaned off the ventilator. And the question is also around, um, the question is also around um, end of life. You know, maybe you want an end of life situation at home. You know, that's something you want. Again, we can help you with that with intensive care at home. Your loved one does not have to die in an intensive care unit or um, or in an LTAC. I don't know where you are. You know, um, you haven't shared your your um, situation, your location with me. So I hope that helps and answers your question. And now, given that your loved one is mentally alert, why don't you? Um, Given that your loved one is mentally alert, why don't you ask them what they want? You know, what we found over the years and, and me having, you know, done the community work and the ICU work, I have very rarely have I seen situations where patients, families do not want to prolong life. It just hasn't happened really in my books. And there are, there is the odd situation, you know, maybe for end stage cancer patients, but just because someone can't be weaned off the ventilator um, doesn't mean um, you know they don't want to live. I'll give you something I'll give you an example that I've learned over the years. Um, so when you talk to friends, families, there's often this notion of well if something ever happens to me, I do not want to be on machines, I do not want to be a quote unquote vegetable which I think is a terrible term and doesn't give justice to anyone who's sort of coming out of an induced coma, you know, who might be confused or delirious after they're coming out of an induced coma. So why do I want to illustrate this? So, you know, when someone sees family member, friend, maybe on TV, someone in intensive care on life support on machines, they say, oh, that's not how I would want to live. And they jump to conclusions and they say, well, if that was me, I wouldn't want to live on machines and I wouldn't want to be a quote unquote vegetable. Again, I think that's a terrible term. Now, when you are faced with a challenge like this in your own family, you will see that you will change your mind very quickly because you might find that your loved one is alert but might be life support dependent. And as soon as you realize, well, my loved one is alert, would I want them to pass away? You will see that you change your mind very quickly. 
um, because alertness is something where you can then communicate with your loved one and you can actually find out what they want, what they what wishes they have. Now, the best option here is to have an advanced care directive. So it's documented, it's a legal document, what you want if, God forbid, you're ever faced with a situation like that. You know, so that would be my best, uh, my best advice here. But then again, keep in mind that even if you do document it, and let's just say you say you don't want to have, you don't want everything done. You know, a lot of patients we've seen over the years, they do change their mind once they are in a situation because they do want to hold on to life. Okay, let's get on to the next question. Um, Yes, so this is a question where uh, Anutha says, your videos are very encouraging, but my son didn't make it. The doctors never intended to wake him up. They lied, avoided my questions, and finally at 1 a.m. in the morning, after doing well for days, his heart mysteriously stopped after three attempts of CPR. Um, his heart would beat again, but the doctor kept stating with confidence it would stop again. And it did at 4.12 a.m., which was exactly three hours later. And it was exactly the time they stated the hospice would take, the hospice shot would take the heart, for the heart to stop. They overruled and denied all transfers and my son died in ICU. He was in a medically induced coma from the 20th of November 22 to the 9th of January 23, so nearly six weeks. He was still paralyzed and sedated, but his heart was beating strong despite their effort, despite their effort to over accepted with high peep and pressure from the ventilation machine. It kept normalizing itself and tears would come down his face and I talked to him. I believe they did hospice to stop his heart without family consent. Ooh. Thank you, Anutha, for sharing this heartbreaking situation with me. Um, I don't know what happened. There's not enough information in here to um, to understand what's happened, you know. Um, and you posted this comment underneath a video that I did a while ago, and the, the title of the video was the ICU team says my girlfriend will be in a vegetative state for the rest of her life. Is this true? And I understand this is what you've been told as well. Now, um, I, I don't know what's happened with your son. I would find it hard to believe that an ICU team can, can time when the heart is to stop. I don't think that this is what's really happening. That an ICU team can time, you know, time when the heart is going to stop. I think the only way you can find answers, Anutha, here is if we have a look at medical records and um, give, give you closure of what's exactly happening. We will find out whether there has been any misconduct, medical negligence, you know. But the only way we can really find out from what you're sharing is by looking at medical records. I hope that helps, Anutha. That's a very tragic situation. I feel very sorry for you and your family that you've lost your son in such tragic circumstances. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next question in a minute. I just need to moisten my throat.
Okay, another email from Kizzy this week. Hello, my name is Kizzy. My mom is 66 in the hospital ICU. She's having problems waking up. They have ran several tests, tests saying all of the tests are coming back good. She's having multiple seizures and they can't figure out why. They have not. So now they have her on life support, given me a few days to decide to put in a trach in her throat and put her in a nursing home. I would like to know more about that and why can't they find out why she's having seizures? Okay, let's read through it again so that I get this, that I understand this correctly. Hi Patrick, my name is Kizzy, my mom is 66 in the hospital ICU. She's having problems waking, waking up. They have run several tests saying all of the tests are coming back good. She's having multiple seizures and they can't figure out why and they have not so now they have her on life support giving me a few days to decide to put in a trach or tracheosome in her throat and put her in a nursing home i would like to know more about that and why can't they find out why she's having the seizure as well okay so let's break this down so you're saying she's having problems waking up obviously she must be in an induced coma or she was in an induced coma She's either still in an induced coma because of the seizures, or if she's no longer in an induced coma, they would be giving her anti-seizure medication such as phenytoin slash dilantin or Keppra or Vimpad. But what sometimes also happens is when patients go into an induced coma, they are with seizures in particular, uh, they are induced with midazolam or Versed because it's a benzodiazepine. And by doing so, you are managing the seizures as well. Because, you know, in some cases, midazolam, again, a benzodiazepine, is given to uh, manage seizures. Now, this is very rarely a long-term strategy with midazolam. And the goal is always to take the midazolam off and wake someone up whilst they are also on other anti-seizure medications, such as, again, most common ones are Keppra or Phenytoin slash Dilantin. So obviously if they can't figure out why she's having seizures, she urgently needs a neurologist review. She might need an EEG. She might need a CT scan of the brain. She might need an MRI scan of the brain. She might need a lumbar puncture to check the CSF for uh, an infection right because that could all lead to seizures so urgently i argue she needs a neurology review with all of the tests that i just mentioned maybe they have already happened um i'm not sure but this is a question you should be asking the next question you should be asking is is she still technically in an induced coma or is she simply not awake and all sed sedatives and opiates have been switched off but I'm 100% certain that she's on anti-seizure medications, the, one that, the ones that I just mentioned. And I'm 100% certain that um, they have sedative effects as well. So she may not have woken up simply because she's under too much sedation still. Okay. Also, if your mom, for example, is having kidney or liver problems, you know, the sedatives and the opiates might stay in the body system for longer because they're not excreted through the kidneys or not metabolized through the liver. And therefore, you know, she might be more drowsy. Now, next you are saying, they have given me a few days to decide to put a tracheostomy in her throat and put her in a nursing home. I would like to know more about that and why can't they find out why she's having the seizure. So again, I believe a neurologist will have some answers for you in this situation. Now, regarding the tracheostomy, I do want to go back to the question that we had from Steve at the beginning of the show. I want to read that out to you again, Kizzy, because I think it ties in with your situation. So Steve earlier asked, several times I've heard you say you want to avoid a tracheostomy at all costs, yet most of the time you seem to feel it's the proper procedure. What's the difference? So the difference is um, that most families come to us similar to Kizzy here when it's often too late. 
So again, when someone goes into ICU, that one of the first questions to ask is how can the tracheostomy be avoided? You need to ask that question on day one. The challenge is that, you know, most families, when they get a loved one, in, when they have a loved one in the ICU, they don't even know what questions to ask. They wouldn't even know that this is an important question to ask, right? Um, so it looks to me like you are down the track here, Kisi, you know, you're probably two, three weeks down the track already. And given that your mum has been in an induced coma for so long and is not waking up and she's having seizures, you know, again, a tracheostomy might be the right thing to do because it's already been two weeks of mechanical ventilation of the tracheostomy. And this is also why I mentioned to Steve earlier, this is why I'm also often saying, yes, a tracheostomy is the right procedure to do because, you know, you're too far down the track. Now, what I will say to you is this, Kissy, going to a nursing home on a ventilator with a tracheostomy is, I believe, is futile, right? It's not the right environment. Uh, someone needs to be weaned off the ventilator and ICU, but before even looking at weaning, Kissy, you need to look at, um, you know, what are the ventilator settings? What are arterial blood gases? You know, um, is there a weaning plan? Because in a nursing home, there won't be a weaning plan. You know, imagine you're going from ICU to a nursing home. That's insanity. You know, there need to be steps taken in between. Your, your mom needs to stay in ICU and she needs to be given, she needs to have a good shot at weaning off the ventilator. Now, again, you haven't shared how many days, but let's just assume you are day seven, your mom is day seven, then I believe there's still a good chance of getting her off the ventilator without doing a tracheostomy. So it really depends on where you are at in the cycle, you know. And like I mentioned to you before, especially in the US, um, with LTAX, ICUs are often not even attempting to wean someone off a ventilator because they go to the trach straight away and try to send patients out as quickly as possible out of sight, out of mind, you know. So your solution, Kissy, in this situation is probably to look at a neurologist's opinion mix, and I think that is very, very urgent. I hope that helps. So then let's do one more question before we wrap this up. Okay, let's wrap this up. Um, hi, Patrick, another email from this week. Hi, Patrick, my mom had the heart pumping only at 20 to 30 percent. She has had a bi has had bypass surgery after two days in ICU. She developed renal failure and one major cardiac arrest, but the heart revived after a few minutes, but currently the ICU team is saying, my 60-year-old mum is in multiple organ failure for the past two or three days. She developed some fever and sometimes blood pressure drops and she's on the ventilator. What are her chances of recovery and how many days will she have to be on the ventilator and in the ICU? Okay, and this is from um, Anna. Anna, um, that sounds very, very complex to me. When you are saying your mom's heart is only pumping at 20 to 30 percent, I would imagine you are referring to ejection fraction, which is also known as contractility of the heart or the pump function. If it's at 20 or at 30 percent after bypass surgery and after cardiac arrest, she is most likely inotrope or vasopressor dependent, such as she might be on dibutamine, milrinone, noradrenaline, or norepinephrine vasopressin. That's what I can predict with an ejection fraction of 20 to 30 percent. I'm not surprised that she's gone into kidney failure in particular um, and because of low blood pressure probably her kidneys weren't probably perfused with an ejection fraction of 20 to 30 percent. It's probably now on the hemofilter most likely you haven't shared that but most likely she is or she will go on that. That also means the statement of that she's in multiple organ failure is probably correct 
The heart has failed, the lungs are failing because she's on a ventilator and the kidneys are failing. So it's certainly critical. You're also saying she developed some fever and sometimes the blood pressure drops. That means she's probably got an infection. She's, there's probably some sepsis. Um, what are her chances of recovery and how many days will she have to be on the ventilator and in ICU? Um, that is a great question. So question here is if she's getting all the treatments that I just shared with, um, you know, inotropes, vasopressors and so forth, is her ejection fraction improving? Is the contractility, the pump function of the heart improving? Because that might help the kidneys improve and it might also help the lungs improve um, to get her off the ventilator. But a situation like that is very, very complex because you've got to look at issues such as she probably would benefit from a PA or Swan-Gans catheter so that the ICU team can check cardiac output, cardiac index, can measure um, systemic vascular resistance. And I'm don't, not wanting to go into too much technical stuff here, but you know, the devil is in the detail in a situation like that, you know, so that the ICU team can check arterial blood gases, mixed venous blood gases. Um, so it really comes down to measuring all the details. The other thing that it comes down to is um, what are her sepsis markers? You know, is white cell count up? Is her lactate going up? Um, you know, those are all questions you need to ask. Now, the trouble by the looks of things starts with the heart here. Now, if her heart is only pumping at only 20-30%, i.e. ejection fraction of 20-30%, the question needs to be raised, would she benefit from ECMO? You know, if she benefited from ECMO, her heart might have time to recover. So what ECMO does is it takes over the function of the heart for a period of time, so it has time to recover. So you should be asking that question to the intensive care team, Anna, whether that is reasonable. Um, so therefore, if she goes on ECMO, she might need many more days on the ventilator, right? She might need a tracheostomy because ECMO is usually not a quick fix. Other questions that could be asked is, does she need, before she goes on ECMO, would she benefit from an intra or aortic balloon pump? right that can also help with contractility of the heart because it concentrates more oxygen around the heart okay so it's usually balloon pump before ecmo and um, that is a question to be asked other questions are would she benefit from an lvat or an rvat to help her again with taking over some of the ventricular function of the heart does she need a heart transplant? Now, your mom is 68. Most of the cutoff ages for ECMO, LVAD, are at transplant are at 65. So I don't want to, you know, don't want to put up your hopes here. But, you know, again, those are questions that you should be asking. I don't think that at the moment it's a matter of how many days will she be on the ventilator. I think at the, matter, at the moment is how can her care and treatment be optimized so she can overcome the multiple organ failure and she can overcome um, this very acute critical illness. And then you can probably look at uh, how many days does she need to get off that ventilator. I hope that helps, uh, Anna. OK. Now, I'd say let's wrap this up for today. If you have any other questions, you can uh, you know, if you're watching this video uh, after it's been posted on YouTube or on our blog, you can always type in questions below the chat pad and I will get to them next week. Um, so, you know, there's multiple ways to get your questions answered. You can simply send us an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com or if you are looking for home care for intensive care at home, you can simply email us at info at intensivecarehome.com or you can just call us on one of the numbers on the top of our websites at intensivecarehotline.com or intensivecarehome.com. Please also check out our membership for families in intensive care at intensivecaresupport.org. 
if you need a medical record review, please contact us as well. Um, and uh, we can help you with medical record reviews while your loved one is in ICU in real time. Um, and we can also help you with a medical record review after intensive care. Now, um, like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel for regular updates for families in intensive care. Uh, click the notification bell and comment below what questions you have so I can address them next week or in a quick tip video. Um, and again, if you need home care for intensive care at home for ventilation, tracheostomy, please contact us, especially if you're in Australia, we're operating in all major capital cities in Australia. Uh, especially if you are NDIS funded, you should contact us. But even if you're not NDIS funded, you should contact us because we provide our own NDIS specialist support coordination and we can help you with that as well. Thank you so much for watching um, and thank you for your support. Please share the video with your friends and families and click the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. This is Patrick Hutzel from IntensiveCareHotline.com and IntensiveCareAtHome.com. And I will talk to you in a few days. Take care.